Welcome to Hebrew Readers Church. I'm your brother Zakwa. This is your brother Kasafo. We have a great lesson for you today going into the women's series. We hope that you were able to catch the first lesson of the women's series. Now we're going into building a safe haven, the woman. All right. Now, first and foremost, we thank everybody for all your support. We thank everybody for supporting the church. We thank everybody for your tithes and offerings. We thank everybody for just the time that you put into helping us with the church. We put in a lot of time by the grace of Allah Hayim, and we are thankful that he has allowed us to do this work. And for that, we praise him and we give glory unto Ahai Allah Hayim. We give glory unto Yache, our Adono, our Lord and Savior. And we pray that you all gain that confidence and that love as well. So going into the women, we want to really, um, we're building a nation because the women are mothers. They're our support, they're our support system. And we have to put that time into them to grow them and to prosper them so that everybody can benefit. So with that being said, our women, especially nowadays in this time, have not been taught how to be loving. They have not been taught how to be supportive. They have not been taught to be tranquil. They have not been taught to put the needs of their husband above their own. And they have not learned how to be a peace for their husband. And in this series, in this, in this lesson specifically, we're going to be talking about how a woman can become a trust for a man, how he can trust her and count on her in his time of need. Okay, so this is what we're, we're working towards. Let's start at the beginning and see what the intent of the woman was created for, right? Casa, can we jump over to Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, please? Sure. Genesis 2 and 18. And Ahaya Lahayim said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. All right. So we see here at the beginning that the woman was created to be a help meet for the man. Kathy, can you give me the definition for help meet, please? Yes. H5828. The meaning aid, help, succor one who helps right so the woman at the beginning was created to be an aid for her husband she was supposed to be aiding him for whatever he had going on or she was she was supposed to be one that helps him with whatever it is that he's trying to do all right now we're going to look at things in our modern day culture right Women were made to help their husbands, right? That was the intent. That was part of the reason for creation of the woman, right? But we're going to say the modern woman for the sake of the lesson, right? Nowadays, the modern woman wants the man to help them. If he can't add anything to what she has going on, then the man is deemed as useless. But we as believers have to stay away from the ways of the world and cleave unto the ways of Allah Hayim. Not being led by those evil spirits, right? Just as Jeremiah chapter 10 and 3 says, the customs of the people are vain, right? Because the way, the direction that they want us to go, it's unprofitable. We can't succumb to these customs because they're unprofitable, right? Kasa, can we jump over to Luke chapter 9, verse 25, please? Sure. Luke 9 and 25, for what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? Right. So in this sense, we're talking about a woman, right? So what advantage is it for a woman to gain everything, everything that she desires, for her to gain the whole world, all the things that she, she has in her heart to do or to get? But yet she lose herself because she went away from the ways of Elohim. She's cast away. 
that mean that she's good for nothing to Elohim. And this is what we have to keep our mind and stay focused on is that our intent, our life, our will, the things that we do are supposed to be for Elohim. So if we're doing things for ourselves, it's contrary to the ways of Elohim because we're not doing it for him. So you end up in a place where you're unprofitable to Elohim, though you're profitable to yourself. So you've made that decision and you have to live with that decision. All right. So let's figure out how Elohim intended for women or young women to actually learn in their youth after being built it up, after being trained in the ways of Elohim. Elohim actually has certain things that young women are supposed to be taught that builds them up to go in the direction that he wants them to go into, right? So let's learn. And this is something that a lot of our women, our modern women, and a lot of women in general haven't learned coming up as an adolescent or coming up as a young woman. They didn't learn these things. So now we have to backtrack and actually start utilizing and implementing these things that they were supposed to be raised in. All right, Brother Casa, can we read uh, Titus chapter 2, verse 4? And you see, I got a couple stops. So you, you. Yeah, it's like we're becoming little children again. This is <laughs> we got to start over. We have to start over. Yeah. Titus chapter 2, verse 4. That they may teach the young women to be sober. All right. So the first thing the young women were supposed to be taught to be sober. Casa, can you give us the definition of sober? Sure. G4994. It means to make of sound mind. That is figuratively to discipline or correct. Teach to be sober. Now, this one is interesting, right? Because it says to make of sound mind so somebody actually has to be instructing the young woman to make her of a sound mind it says to discipline or to correct so somebody is literally correcting her or disciplining her and a lot of times that would be the father the father would discipline and correct the daughter and he would pretty much align her to go the right direction right and she has to be made of that sound mind she has to be willing to listen to her father so that she can learn the ways of Allah so she can learn the right direction to go, right? So that's sober, right? Because she has to be willing to listen. Okay. What's the next one, Brother Casa? To love their husbands. All right. Now, what's the definition of um, to love their husbands? G5362. It means... Fond of man, that is, affectionate as a wife. I love their husbands. Now, here we are. Young women were supposed to be taught that they have to be fond. They have to love their husband. So they actually have to be fond of him. Now, the, the word fond means having an affection or liking for. So you actually have to like your husband. Okay. And you have to be affectionate toward him because you like him as a wife, okay? These are the things that our young women were taught from a youth so that they can understand, hey, when you have a husband, you have to like him. You have to be fond of him. You have to have that liking or that admiration or that affection toward him so you can walk in the fruits of the Spirit, so you can be gentle. You know, so you can't be tranquil, right? <laughs> uh, the next one, Brother Casa. To love their children. Now, we actually taught our young women to love their children as well. Can you give us the definition of that, Brother Casa? Sure. G5388. It means fond of one's children. That is maternal. Love their children. All right, so the same fondness you have, you have towards your husband, you have to have towards your children. You have to love them the same way. You have to have that affection or that liking. You have to like your children. Now, 
modern day, a lot of women don't like their children. They speak ill of their children. And it's 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 an amazing thing because the women are supposed to be the ones raising the children. So it's actually your fault that you don't like your own children because you're supposed to be the one building your children up in the way that they should go. Of course, the father has his part, but even in modern day society, they get the father out of the way. So the father can't even raise the children up in the way that they should go. They can't correct the daughters. They can't correct the sons in a lot of instances. And of course, you see the statistics of a father and a mother household, even if they're not walking in the right direction, it still has an impact on the children. Now think about you have two people walking in the same direction in the ways of Allah and the ways of Ahaya, and they're actually fond of their children and they're actually correcting and teaching their children to be sober, then you can see the impact that it will have on the children. All right? Now maternal. The word maternal is used to describe feelings or actions that are typical of those of a kind mother toward her children. So when it says that it's maternal, the woman is supposed to be kind toward her children. It says feelings or actions. So she has to be kind in her actions she has to be kind in her feelings toward her children. You can see this dichotomy of how we've been taught and the things that we've seen in our life, how they're so contrary to how we should have been raised. Okay. All right, Brother Casa, can we continue to um, Titus chapter 2, verse 5, please? Sure. Titus 2 and 5, to be discreet. All right. Can we get the definition of discreet, please? Sure. G4998, safe in mind or sound in mind, that is, self-controlled, moderate as to opinion or passion, discreet, sober, temperate. All right. So as a youth... Our women were taught to be discreet, right? They were taught to be self-controlled. That means that they were temperate. They were learning temperance from a young age. They were learning to control themselves. One, to control themselves in their opinion. And two, to control themselves in their passion. So they didn't allow their emotions to dictate or to control them. They were actually learning how to be in control of their own bodies and control of their own mind. Now, this is some powerful stuff. This is stuff that grown people don't even know nowadays. So you can understand how powerful our women were when they were coming up as children in these environments, in the society that we had. And you can see how strong they were. By the time they got up an adult age, being taught this from as a young woman, Right. <laughs> What's the next one, Brother Casa? Chaste. Chaste. Okay. Go ahead, brother. The definition G53 properly clean, that is figuratively innocent, modest, perfect, chaste, clean, pure. Right. So from a young age, they were taught to be innocent and modest. They were taught to be pure. They were taught to be pure, one, in deeds, in mind. So they were taught not to be double-minded, not to be doing something, looking to get something out of it. They were taught to be innocent. They were taught to actually be sincere. And pure. These are great things that these children are learning. Yeah. And that sincerity would make them perfect. Yes, it would. A perfect heart. Yeah. 
What's the next one, Brother Casa? Keepers at home. All right, let's, what's the definition of that? G3626. A guard. Beware. A stayer at home that is domestically inclined, a good housekeeper. Keeper at home. Now, <laughs> right, we're going to have a little laugh. Okay. <laughs> so it's, it's all right to laugh. Now, first, a guard, right? Because this lesson is about a woman being a safe haven, right? And as soon as we went into how the young women were being raised and how they were being taught, and one of the ones is a keeper at home, she's a guard of the house. She's a keeper of the house. That's part of her job. She keeps the house. She protects it from anything intruding into the household, whether it be a person or whether it be a spirit, whether it be anything. She's supposed to be a guard to the house. She's supposed to make sure everything is operating correctly and that there's nothing going on that's abnormal or anything that's a threat. Also, a stare at home. That means that she's not out in the streets. She's not out at the clubs. She's not at the bars. She's not hanging out. She's at home. She comes home. She goes and does what she needs to do. She comes home to her family. And also a good housekeeper. That means that she takes care of the house. She makes sure everything looks well. Everything is nice. Because that's her dwelling place. She has to learn how to be a safe haven herself. And she also has to learn how to create a safe haven. She's creating a safe haven inside of the house. She's creating a comfortable place for everyone to lay their head, the husband to the children. Okay. What's the next one, Brother Casa? Good. Good. Very simple. What's the definition of that? G A T. <laughs> Good. In any sense, often as a noun, benefit, good, good things, well. Right. So she's supposed to be beneficial. And that's why it says good in any sense, often as a noun. So anything that she does is supposed to be beneficial to the household. She's supposed to be good in all aspects. Okay. Makes Brother her very Kasha. selfless. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was saying it makes her very selfless. Like she, everything she's thinking of doing and doing is for the best of her family. Of everybody. Because yeah. she's supposed to be that keeper of the house. So everything that she does is supposed to benefit everybody. All right. All right, you ready for the next one, Brother Castle? Yes. Obedient right. to their own husbands. All right, so from a youth, the young women are actually trained and brought up to be obedient to their own husband. So you can see a lot of women and the modern women, I don't know too many households that actually teach their daughters or actually prepare their daughters for a husband in a good sense. Now, we've seen some bad cases of mothers, and it's usually the mothers that actually are teaching their daughters how to get what they want out of a man. But rarely do we see mothers or fathers or households teaching their daughters how to be obedient to a husband when they get one. What's the definition of obedient to their own husbands? G fifty two ninety three. To subordinate, reflexively to obey. Be under obedience, obedient. Put under, subdue unto. Be subject, make subject, or make subject unto. Be in subjection. Submit self unto. So, 
in the context of being obedient to the own husbands, you're submitting yourself to your husband. So whatever he asks of you, if it's in righteousness, you do it. You say, okay, I'll take care of it. I'll do it, right? To obey, like you're not giving him a lot of lip when he asks you to do something or you're not hoffing or scoffing. You know, we have to be in the mindset of being what Allah has ordained for the women to be, which is an aid. And that's the mindset of a woman who's obedient to a husband because she knows she's an aid to a husband. And she's coming up in that knowing, hey, I'm an aid, anything you need from me. If I see something that I know will help, because she has to be good too. So if she sees something that she knows that will help with whatever you have going on, okay, it's good to do it because you're actually being good. You're actually keeping the house because the house, the house is a physical, but the house is also outer body, right? Because everybody's not in the house all the time, but yet it's still the house. So even with helping with other things that pertain to the family, you're still helping the house so that you can understand that it's more than just of physical building, even as Yache talks about the temple being more than just a physical building. The women on a lower level are taking care of a house, which is more than just a physical building. Okay. You want to finish it off, Brother Casa? You got anything? I thought Leia exemplified that really well in her subjection. And of course, we know she was blessed with the amount of children she had. And that she in Jubilees speaks of how Jacob loved her exceedingly because her whole life, she never answered him a mean word. But in everything she did, she was good unto him. So to see that in the women, as you mentioned, the women of old, these things they were learning, it really prepared them. And you see it in Leah, right. specifically for the topic we're on we're definitely gonna leave it right there because she did make some mistakes but yeah and her own selfishness but how you deliver and i don't really know i can't really say that she was brought up because her father i don't know her father is the way that, the way that he was going he um i think it was just alahayim Cause I can't say her father raised them up in the, in that in that way. You see what I'm saying? Interesting, yes. And I think it to to bring it together to see for the women today, the modern women can come from the same situations as Rachel and Leah, where their parents weren't teaching them the right things. But look how being given a good husband. They learned, they right. had experiences and they came out of it. And we see the end product of Leah and that can be encouraging to know you don't have to start off in the right place is where you end up. Right. It's That's the decisions that you make. And right now it's the decisions that the women are going to make from here on that's going to determine their future. Because if you don't want to change, then you're stuck in it you're stuck in that cycle and the whole thing about now is learning so that you can make the changes although these things weren't taught to us when they were supposed to be taught to us we have the opportunity now yeah. Yeah. goes on to say that the word of Allah be not blasphemed All right so we taught these things unto our daughters so that the word of Allah be not blasphemed through their works, because they're supposed to be a resemblance or a reflection of what Allah created the woman to be. And if they are walking contrary to those ways, it brings a reproach upon Allah, especially if they're calling upon and operating as if they're operating in the ways of Allah. Right. 
or calling upon Elohim. They become a spokesperson for Elohim through their works, as we all do. And if they're not operating in the ways and good works in the ways of Elohim, it brings a reproach into Elohim. And people are looking like, oh, I don't, I see the fruit of that Elohim. I don't want anything to do with it. So it actually brings a reproach to Elohim, right? So we don't want to blaspheme his name, right? Now, these things are rarely found amongst women today. Not only Hebrew women, but all women, because we all have drunk of the wine of Babylon. What have our women learned? And how does it affect the family? If the case isn't bad enough that nobody wants to be with her. So the modern women today, the things that they learn, let's see how it actually affects the household, right? And that's for the ones that are at a place where somebody is willing to put up and be with them compared to the ones where some of the women are so far off or so far gone that nobody wants to put up with them and they end up just being single. Uh, can we jump over to Proverbs chapter 14, verse 1? And we're going to see what happens when a woman operates in ways opposed Elohim. Okay. Proverbs 14 and 1. Every wise woman buildeth her house, but the foolish plucketh it down with her hands. All right. So we got the wise woman that actually builds the house, but the foolish woman plucked it down with her hands. Now, you know how Elohim is. He's very specific when he says things. And when, you know, hands means works. So with her works, she's literally tearing down the house on her own. Okay? So, so let's see how the modern woman is seen in the eyes of Elohim and also how she tears down her own house. Right? Pastor, can we read uh, Lamentations chapter 4, verse 3, please? Lamentations 4 and 3. Even the sea monsters draw out the breasts. They give suck to their young ones. So, right. Oh. Even the sea monsters that live in the sea, they actually nourish their children. Right? They draw out the breasts and they nourish their children. They make sure that their children are well nourished and they take care of them. Right? Go ahead, Brother Cosmo. The daughter of my people is become cruel, like the ostriches in the wilderness. So if anybody has any knowledge of ostriches, ostriches are very, very harsh, okay? And it's crazy because Allah um, compared the women that operate not in his ways as ostriches. And we know how it is nowadays a lot of women if they even want to have children that's the first thing a lot of them don't even want to have children so you can see how that cruelty has entered into the habitation right and also just like the monsters in the water they draw out the breath a lot of women don't want to breastfeed their children because of their own selfish reasons of maybe keeping their figure the way they want it or or just in a lot of times just being selfish because they don't want to they don't want to do it they don't want to breastfeed all right now in a whole sense all right women and we're talking about the women of lamentations four and three right more so the modern woman. I'm trying to keep it in that generic term so that we're not going about trying to be very specific. Uh, I'm not saying that all modern women are the same. I'm just using that as a term so that everybody can understand what I'm talking about. Right? Now, the modern woman doesn't want to nourish their husbands nor their children. Right? And this is an interesting part of the lesson because the woman was supposed to be an aide. 
So for a woman not to want to nourish the husband nor the children, where does it leave the woman? You see what I'm saying? It leaves her in a void. It leaves her in a place where it's not what Allah had intended for her to be. You see what I'm saying? Let's continue on the Proverbs 25 and 23. We're going to continue to see how a woman tears down her own house through her works, right? When she's operating in these unorderly fashions, okay? Proverbs 25, verse 23. The north wind driveth away rain, so doth an angry countenance a backbite in tongue. All right. So just like the north wind, when it's raining, the north wind will come and it'll blow the rain away. So doeth an angry countenance of a woman and a backbiting tongue. Now, we, all right, we, we've seen it. Everybody's been on whether it be um, social media, whether it be reality shows, whether it be real life, whether it be your friend, uh, whether it be you. We've seen the angry countenance and the backbiting tongue where something's always a problem or you're always tearing somebody down or you always have something to say that's negative where you're not really nourishing. And in this case, we're talking about a husband or the man that you're with, you're not really nourishing him. The backbiting and the angry countenance is not nourishing. It's tearing down the house because he doesn't feel good with your angry countenance all the time. He doesn't feel good with your backbiting, with you talking bad about him or saying negative things, or every time that he messes up, you're throwing it in his face, or, you know, every time that he doesn't do something according to your standard, it becomes a problem. So the aid, the aid is missing. The aid starts to go away. The woman in her respectful order starts diminishing, and you see what how it affects the household we're going to continue to go because it's, it's, we're going to continue to see the effects and the different things that actually affect the household how she's actually tearing down her own house on her own uh can we jump over to proverbs chapter 21 verse 9 and 10 please brother cousin sure proverbs 21 verse 9 it is better to dwell in a corner of the housetop than with a brawling woman in a wide house it's better to dwell in the corner of a housetop. That's what he said for the man. It's better for you to go and dwell, go in the top of the house, go find you a corner and get you some peace than to dwell with a brawling woman in a big house because it's never going to stop. It's never not going to be a problem. She didn't learn how to be at peace. She didn't learn how to be tranquil. She wasn't brought up in these essential, fundamental things that the young women were brought up in according to the Hebrew culture. And you can see the effects of it. The man is not at peace. He's not happy. He's dealing with a brawling woman who is angry, who always has a problem, who has an angry countenance. She's backbiting. She's, she's tearing him down. She's tearing down the house. We have to learn how to be nourishing when, well, you guys, I'm, I'm a guy, but I'm, I'm with you because I'm teaching, I'm, I'm helping you. We, we're getting through this. Having to learn how to be nourishing, having to learn how to be an aid, having to learn how to be content and not only thinking of yourself, but thinking of everybody. Can you continue with uh, Proverbs 21 and 10, Brother Casa, please? Sure. The soul of the wicked desireth evil. His neighbor findeth no favor in his eyes. Now, this part is very interesting. 
The soul of the wicked desires evil, right? When a woman's desires are not aligned with Elohim or highest, then it gives place for evil spirits. Though she may not understand how, she may not understand how she's given place for evil spirits. Evil spirits don't need anybody to understand how they operate to function. So you don't have to understand what's going on for the evil spirit to operate. In fact, the evil spirit actually has more power over you, over you when you don't actually understand what's going on. So if you're not understanding what's happening, the evil spirits are operating in you, right? Because it says the soul of the wicked desire of evil. Now, because you don't know the ways of righteousness, you're not actually exercising the ways of righteousness. You're not actually desiring the ways of righteousness. That means that the ways of evil can attach to you. So you start operating in those evil spirits, and it doesn't matter if you understand what's going on or not. It doesn't matter if you believe that if evil spirits are not, they're still going to operate. Because they don't need you to believe. This isn't Yache. You don't have to believe. Just like Yache operates, whether you believe or not. But to believe on him is how you get salvation, although that's not a requirement for evil spirits. You don't have to believe on evil spirits for you to go to hell. You're just going to go because that's your works. That's the spirits that you're operating in. So it doesn't matter if you understand or not. And it's great to get this understanding so that you can actually turn from it. Now, the second part of this is actually good as well. It says, his neighbor findeth no favor in his eyes. Now, we're going to use this in the context of, of women, right? How it says his slash her, we're going to use it as her today. Neighbor find, finds no favor in his or her eyes, right? When a wife is supposed to be fond of her husband, remember? Right. So you can see how when a woman is not operating in the right spirit, she doesn't have that fondness, right? Now, because she doesn't have that fondness, you can see how she operates toward him without having that fondness. He doesn't have any favor in her eyes. So you can see the contrariness of the world versus the highest way. Allah is teaching us. He's teaching us how to be perfect, how to have a great house, how to have a great foundation, how to be at peace with one another, tranquil with one another, happy with one another. But if we allow ourselves to continue operating in the ways that are contrary to his, we don't bring forth good fruit. Our house gets torn down. We're bickering. We're fighting. There's no peace. There's no love. Right? And you can see the angry countenance, even the angry countenance of the woman. It's the peace within her. She has to grow herself so that she can actually take what she learned and that growth and that and the strength and the good things that she learned and start applying it to her household. You can't build up something else without first being built yourself. I can't go and build someone else's house and then my house is in shambles because I'm not going to be able to teach them anything that's going to be constructive. It may sound good, but I'm the reflection of the fruit of it because you see my house. All right. Let's continue. We're still going into how a woman can tear down her own house. So 
Um, Kasa, can we go into uh, Ecclesiasticus chapter 25, verse 22? Sure. Ecclesiasticus chapter 25, verse 22. A woman, if she maintain her husband, is full of anger. These scriptures are amazing. All right. It says, a woman, if she maintain her husband, so we're still talking about a woman that's not operating correctly, right? First off, if she is able to maintain him, that means that if he don't already leave her because of the way she's operating, right? And if he actually sticks around and puts up with the way that she's operating, she becomes full of anger. She doesn't just stop where she is. It gets worse if a man actually puts up with it. Now, what is full of anger? G3709, properly desire as a reaching forth or excitement of the mind. That is, by analogy, violent passion, ire, or justifiable abhorrence. By implication, punishment, anger, indignation, vengeance, wrath. Anger can go into a, a wide range of emotions, but all of them are going to be violent. Okay? It says, ire or justifiable abhorrence. So that means that whatever it is she does in anger or whatever violent emotion is, she justifies herself in it. That she's right. And she has the right to feel that way. So you can see how the pride starts coming into the picture where because you're putting up with it, she's getting more bold in it. Okay. And she loses that respect for him. She loses that fondness. She's losing it more and more. And then we see it all the time. People just get into that relationship where you're just mentally getting abused, if not physically also. And you're just staying in it. What's the next word, Brother Casa? Impudence. Do you have, can you read the definition of that, please? Sure. It means showing scorn for or disregard of others. Insolent, disrespectful. So the man sticks around. She doesn't change. She actually gets worse. She gets worse in anger, and she also gets worse in impudence. She gets more disrespectful. So you can see it a lot of times where she's calling him out his name. She's, you know, um, saying things in front of his friends, um, just has no respect for him. So you can see the scriptures are never telling us a story. It's always telling us the truth. And it's just explaining what actually is happening in these different situations, right? Especially with our women. Uh, can you continue, Brother Casa? And much reproach. And much reproach. Right? What's the definition of reproach, Casa? G3679, to defame, that is, rail at, chide, taunt, cast in teeth, suffer reproach, revile, upbraid. So you can see that comes as well. She starts defaming him, whether she's calling him a female dog or whether she's saying he ain't worth nothing or saying he's this or he's that, you know, to pretty much to, to down him. She starts defaming him. She rails at him. She's starting to yell. She's getting more irate. She's chiding. She always has something negative to say about you, to taunt you. Like she's always making fun of you or whenever she has a chance to take a shot at you, she takes it. Like she's tearing down her own house. 
brick by brick, wood by wood, tearing it down. And this is all opposite of being an aide. It's all opposite of being a loving wife. It's all opposite of being a keeper of home, keeper of the house. Right? And you can see the opposite because a wise woman, she's building the house. And we're going to go into that after we get done with this, after we see how a woman tears down the house, how she can. We're going to see how a wise woman actually builds it. Okay. Brother Costa, can we um go over to Ecclesiasticus 25 and 23 now, please? Sure. Ecclesiasticus 25, verse 23. A wicked woman abateth the courage. All right. Now, abateth means causes to become smaller. Right? So a wicked woman, she actually causes the husband's courage to become smaller. She's not encouraging him. She's actually diminishing him. Go ahead, Brother Cousin. Maketh an heavy countenance and a wounded heart. So she's making the man have a heavy countenance because everything that she's doing and everything that she's saying to him is breaking him down. Right? And he has a wounded heart because of the way that she's treating him. His heart is wounded. And he's like, if he's still around, he actually loves her. But you can see he's being abused. Like, all women have to learn not to be abusive, but to be someone that builds the house, not one that tears it down. And that abuse by operating in these spirits and, and doing these things actually is tearing down the house. Uh, continue, Brother Costa. A woman that will not comfort her husband in distress maketh weak hands and feeble knees. All right. So we see the wicked woman will not comfort her husband, whereas the wise woman will actually comfort her husband, right? And she strengthens her husband. She strengthens her house. You got anything, Kasa, while we continue? Because we, we, we going right now. <laughs> well, just, and we see what the unwise woman does, how her actions the scriptures show how what she does, what she says, it truly affects a man. Right. He feels it. You start to see it in his countenance, his heart. He loses his strength because he depends on her for strength. Actually, she was made to be his help in the world. Right. Be the one, the pillar that keeps him up and makes him stand tall in the faith. And we see here, as we talked in the last lesson about the power of a woman, and here in continue, we get to see the power of a woman. Right. In different <laughs> dichotomies. <laughs> yes. She's very important. The most important thing in the faith in building a family, because she's the glue to it all. Well, she's the one that brings forth the, 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 the children, the family. <laughs> She builds the man and helps raise up his name with his children. And the house, you had mentioned earlier how the house, she makes the home into a comfort zone, into a safe place for the whole family. Right. And it being not just physical, but also spiritual, she herself is a comfort and a safe place to her family. Her husband, life is hard. He's getting tore up in the world. He comes home or he calls her, even if he's not at home, for comfort. To hear maybe the pleasantness of her voice or the cheerfulness of her optimistic perspective about things when things may be hard. The children going through what they're going through in life. They come to her, mommy this, mommy that. <laughs> they're coming to her for succor. So in knowing that and then seeing how an unwise woman, imagine how hard that could be for a family. 
You don't have a safe haven. Right. You go out into the world and get tore up and beat up, and then you come home and get diminished and downtrodden. Right. So. Need them. Very much need them. So. Right. Raise a lesson to help see. <laughs> yeah, it was putting a smack dab in your face. <laughs> yeah. So there's going to be no confusion after this lesson. Yeah. Now, we're going to continue with the unwise woman. Um, part of the, the thing with the unwise woman is the man can't trust her. And a lot of times because of all these evil spirits that's going on the man goes out into the world just as brother casa said he has to deal with everything that he has to deal with in the world and also at the same time he's thinking about how he has an untrustworthy wife at the house so you can understand he's already getting diminished and destroyed and also when he leaves, he's still getting destroyed by the thoughts of the evil spirits. And we know that fornication is very prevalent amongst women. Uh, let's read that so everybody can have the understanding and the basis of where we're speaking from so that we can actually touch on it. Um, let's go to the Testament of Reuben, chapter 5, verse 1, and we're going to read that chapter. Testament of Reuben, chapter 5. For evil are women, my children, and since they have no power or strength over a man, they use wiles by outward attractions that they may draw him to themselves. Now we're talking about the unwise women, okay? Go ahead. And whom they cannot bewitch by outward attractions, him they overcome by craft. For moreover, concerning them, the angel of the Lord told me and taught me that women are overcome by the spirit of fornication more than men, and in their heart they plot against men. And by means of their adornment, they deceive first their minds, and by the glance of the eye, instill the poison. And then, through the accomplished act, they take them captive. For a woman cannot force a man openly, but by a harlot's bearing, she beguiles him. Flee therefore fornication, my children and command your wives and your daughters that they adore not their heads and faces to deceive the mind. Because every woman who useth these wiles hath been reserved for eternal punishment. For thus their Lord the watchers, who were before the flood, for as these continually beheld them, they lusted after them. And they conceived the act in their mind, for they changed themselves into the shape of men and appeared to them when they were with their husbands. And the women, lusting in their minds after their forms, gave birth to giants. For the watchers appeared to them as reaching even unto heaven. All right. So we can see this isn't just an opinion that fornication attacks women more than men. It was actually told from the angel, right? This actually came from Elohim, right? And we can see we were instructed, fathers were instructed to teach the wives and the daughters not to adorn their heads and faces to deceive the mind. He didn't say not to adorn your heads and faces. He said, don't do it with the intent of trying to capture somebody or trying to deceive somebody. Okay. So it's the intent. It's the heart. You can see how like the desires of a woman actually lead her either the right direction or the wrong direction. If her desires are aligned with Alahayim, then she's going to do the right thing. If her desires are aligned with her own wants, then she's going to do the wrong thing. So you can see how even in this, women have to be very, very on guard with themselves. And they have to be on guard how fornication is working against them or when fornication is working against them so that they actually can fight against it. Okay. Yeah. 
you had even had, for example, a righteous woman, Judith, with the days of her husband, she adorned herself to please her husband. And the evidence is shown in that when her husband was gone, she didn't wear all her jewelry and her nice things and her adorn herself as she used to in her days of gladness with her husband, showing her intent was for her husband, not just to be seen or to deceive another man. As well as, was it Susan? Susanna? Susanna. Susanna, with her husband, she would actually veil her face because she knew she was very beautiful. But her desire was for that beauty only to be beheld by her husband. And she was specifically raised up in the law of Moses by her parents. So we could see how that proper upbringing had of a right mindset. Amen. All right. Let's go ahead and continue. So now that we have the framework of fornication and how fornication operates and works against women, right? We can now understand why Hyatt was so focused on the daughters in Isaiah chapter three, seeing that fornication and pride are not the best combination. If you're not familiar with Isaiah chapter three, I'm going to read a short piece of it. So Isaiah three is a future prophecy of how the women, how the daughters of Zion are going to be. And it goes into fornication and pride. So you can see how in the Testament of Reuben, fornication alone was insinuating upon those women. But now let's put fornication and pride together because pride is actually what led the women to actually deal with the watchers because the watchers came upon the women that were with their husbands. Those women were actually married. And you can see that same spirit in Isaiah chapter 3. We're going to read Isaiah chapter 3, verse 16. You can see that same spirit that actually led the women to actually deal with the watchers, even though they were married. Uh, Katsi, can we read Isaiah chapter 3, verse 16, please? Yes. Moreover, Ahiasaiah, because the daughters of Zion are haughty and walk with stretched forth necks, and wanton eyes, walking and mincing as they go, and making a tinkling with their feet. Right. So you see the haughtiness, the pride. You can't tell them nothing. They're justified. Even as it spoke about when we were reading in, um, well, that Ecclesiasticus 25 and 22, how it actually talked about um, with anger, how she's justifiable. Yeah. She um, made her husband, she's full of anger, impudence, right. much reproach. So you can see she's justified, she's haughty, that pride is in her. You can't yeah. tell her anything. And Judah mentioned the spirit of fornication teaches arrogance. So fornication right. helps take her on to that direction. She's walking with a stretched forth neck and wanton eyes. So you can see the fornication as well because she doesn't have her eyes set upon her husband. Her eyes are all over the place, all right? And this is the future prophecy. So women, this is very important that we have to have these conversations and have these dialogues to actually keep everybody going in the right direction because you go off in another direction we've seen it happen before we have the scriptures we have the records that shows it happened so we actually have to be circumspect on guard for it not to happen again okay interestingly with the wanton eyes seeing fornication already being the source of leading to the haughtiness the arrogance remember jealousy dwells all jealousy according to Reuben, dwells in the lust of fornication and here now, a woman to lose that fondness for her husband and affection toward her husband that she was taught or supposed to be taught from a youth through the jealousy of fornication. Now she's looking elsewhere, not content with what she has. That's exactly correct. That's exactly correct. And we're about to go into it right now. Um, the spirit of, we're about to have an example of the spirit of fornication operating in a woman. Uh, okay, we go to Proverbs chapter 7. We're going to start at 10. We're going to read down to 23, please. Proverbs chapter 7, verse 10. 
Proverbs chapter 7, verse 10. And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot. So first off, she's not dressing seemly. Modest, she's not modest. She's not seemly in her clothing, right? And subtle of heart. Right. So subtle means that she conceals. That means she's sneaky. So she operates very sneakily. Like she, she's, she's concealing everything that she's doing. She's not telling you. She's not being open. She, she's moving very stealth-like. Deceitful. Right. Verse 11. She is loud and stubborn. Her feet abide not in her house. So she's not a keeper of home. She's not a keeper of the house. She's all over the place. She's loud. She's stubborn. You can't tell her anything. And she goes what she wants. Verse 12. Now is she without. Now in the streets. And lieth in wait at every corner. Because she's not content. And this is actually a married woman. This woman is actually married. So you actually get to see how that fornication and even that jealousy and not being um, content, as Brother Kosovo was talking about, actually operates. Yeah. She's went from being the guard of the home, standing watch and protecting it. Now she's the hunter. Right. Go verse, ahead. verse 13. So she caught him and kissed him. And with an impudent face said unto him, I have peace offerings with me. This day have I paid my vows. Therefore came I forth to meet thee, diligently to seek thy face, and I have found thee. She found somebody that tickled her fancy. With her wanton eyes, she found somebody that she actually was like, ooh, I like him. He's my type. Verse, verse 16, I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry, with carved works, with fine linen of Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Okay. Now, remember we talked about how all these spirits would start operating in a woman and how when the man, the man is getting abused. The man goes out to work or does whatever he's doing, and he has to worry about what's going on at his own house. This is the woman. She's using everything that the man has provided for her. She's using it for another man. She's saying all these things that she's done, perfumes her bed with myrrh and aloes and cinnamon and the tapestry and the linen of Egypt, all of these things that's in that man's house. Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with loves. For the good man is not at home. For the good man is not at home. He is gone on a long journey. He had taken a bag of money with him and will come at the day appointed. So you know he's not happy. He's not a happy man because he don't want to be at home. He took a bag of money and he done left. He's trying to get some peace. With her much fair speech, she caused him to yield. With the flattering of her lips, she forced him. He goeth after her straightway as an ox goeth to the slaughter, or as a fool to the correction of the stocks. Till a dart strike through his liver, as a bird hasted to the snare, and knoweth not that it is for his life. All right. So she's taking herself down and the guy with her. That's actually committing adultery with her. We're not going to go all into that because that's going to add a lot longer to this lesson. So we're going to continue. <laughs> um, but we are going to touch on the effects of sinning against your flesh. Um, Brother Costa, can we go to 1 Corinthians 6 and 15? We're going to read to down to 20 so that we can understand what's actually happening when you're actually joining yourself with someone that's in that 
fornicative or adultery spirit. First Corinthians six and fifteen. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the member of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? Allah, I am forbidden. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. All right. So this goes for men and women. This is general speaking. When you join yourself to a harlot, you become one flesh with that harlot. Okay, like, go ahead, Brother Costa. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. All right. So you take on the spirit of that harlot. You're taking on that because you're joining yourself to it. That's why when you go out and you commit fornication with somebody that's sleeping around all over the place or commit adultery with another woman or another man, you actually start having a lot of trouble spiritually because you connect yourself with that person and the spirits that they're dealing with. Go ahead, Brother Costa. Flee fornication. For every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committed fornication sinneth against his own body. Hmm. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you? which ye have of Allah Hayim, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify Allah Hayim in your body and in your spirit, which are Allah Hayim's. All right. So we're supposed to be joined to Allah Hayim. We're supposed to be operating in the spirit of Allah Hayim. Just like um, in Matthew, when it talks about how we're supposed to be swept clean and garnished, we're not supposed to have any evil spirits dwelling in us. Because we're given our body as a sacrifice to Allah Hayim. And when we are joined with the spouse that Allah Hayim has ordained for us to be joined with, then it brings joy unto Allah Hayim. And that, that good spirit of Allah Hayim is being multiplied. But if we're joining ourselves with the harlot or fornicator, then the evil spirit is being multiplied. Okay? Now... Let's get on to the good wise woman, okay? We see how the unwise woman can tear down a house. There's so many different ways, so many different facets, okay? And we have to stay away from those things. If you haven't learned anything, you learned the things that are not profitable, the things that are not good, the things that are not seen or deemed as well in the sight of Allah Hayyam. And if not anything else, you learn to stay away from those things. But let's touch on the things that are actually profitable, the things that Allah, how Allah actually wants the women to operate. And we can see the continuation from the things that Allah has taught the young women from a youth, or in this case, our women that have to learn these things even now. Praise Allah for it. You get to learn these things even now. And we get to see how you can build upon these things. Okay. Um, Brother Casa, let's start at Sirach chapter 36 and 24. And then we're going to go into Sirach 26 and 22. Okay. Sirach, which is the same book as Ecclesiasticus, as we were reading earlier. Chapter 36, verse 24. He that getheth a wife beginneth a possession, a help like unto himself, and a pillow of rest. All right. So he that gives the wife, so you, you get your wife from Allah Hayim. He gives you a portion, right? You get a help like unto yourself. So this is the goal. We want a help like unto ourselves. We want somebody that's going to help us to do the things in which we would do ourselves. You got somebody that's actually being an aid, right? So she's growing and being an aid for you, right? And she's also a pillar of rest. So we're going to understand how she's growing and being an aid and how she's actually becoming a pillow of rest, right? So let's go into the pillow of rest, okay? We're going to go and see how she becomes that pillar or that tower for her husband. Uh, so rock 26 and 22, Brother Casa. So rock chapter 26, verse 22, a harlot shall be accounted a spittle, but a married woman is a tower against death to her husband. All right. 
So a married woman is a tower against death to a husband, and we're going to understand how she's that tower against death for him. Go ahead, Brother Cousin. Verse 23, a wicked woman is given as a portion to a wicked man, but a holy woman is given to him that feareth the Lord. So first off, the man needs to fear the Lord. The man has to actually learn how to walk in the ways of Allah. And as you've seen, we did the series for the men, building the men in faith. We wanted to make sure that the men were prepared and building themselves so that Allah would actually give them a woman that actually fears the Lord and one that's willing to actually learn the right ways of Allah to grow in them. Verse 24, a dishonest woman contemneth shame, but an honest woman will reverence her husband. Now, an honest woman will reverence her husband. As we've seen the unwise woman, which is dishonest in this scenario, how she had no reverence for her husband. She would talk down to him. Right? She would defame him. But an honest woman or a wise woman will reverence her husband. She has that reverence. She has that fondness for her husband. And because she has that fondness for her husband, she uplifts him. She helps him. Go ahead, Brother Cousin. Verse 25. A shameless woman shall be counted as a dog. But she that is shame-faced will fear the Lord. So she's not out. She's not just out in the streets. She's a keeper at home. She's taking care of the family. She's not a shameless woman that has no shame and that's all over the place and doing whatever she wants to do where she can't be controlled. She's unleashed. No man can humble her. She doesn't want to be taught. Whereas a shame-faced woman, she wants to be taught. She is taught to fear the Lord. She's taught to walk in the ways of the Lord. She learns how to nourish and how to grow and how to prosper her household. Go ahead, Brother Casa. Verse 26. A woman that honoreth her husband shall be judged wise of all, but she that dishonoreth him in her pride shall be counted an unholy of all. Now you see the pride. And you see if a woman dishonor of her husband in pride, that means that a woman can only honor her husband in humility. So a woman in honor of her husband shall be judged wise of all because she's operating in the spirit of humility. Whereas you see a woman dishonor of her husband, it's because of the pride. Go ahead, Brother Cousin. Verse 27, a loud crying woman and a scold shall be sought out to drive away the enemies. A loud crying woman in a scold shall be sought out to drive away the enemies. She has no connection with your enemies. She's going to cry out and she's going to scold them. She's going to be a keeper of the house, just like we were talking about, not allowing the enemies to come in, whether spiritual or physical. She's going to be a keeper of the house. And she's going to cry out when something's wrong. She's going to scold when somebody's operating unrighteously. Like, hold on, something's not right. She drives away the enemy. Now, also, the wise woman, she gains the trust of her husband. These are the things that strengthen a household because if your husband can trust you, well, we're just going to read it. Brother Kassid, let Allah speak. Uh, Proverbs chapter 31, verse 10. And we're going to read down to 31, please. All right. Proverbs chapter 31, verse 10. Who can find a virtuous woman? 
for her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband does safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. She would do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. She is like the merchant ships. She bringeth her food from afar. She riseth also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. She considereth a field and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hands she planteth a vineyard. She girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. She layeth her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold the distaff. She shredded out her hands to the poor, yea, she reaches forth her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry, her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gates, when he sitteth among the elders of the land. She maketh fine linen and selleth it, and delivereth the girdles unto the merchant. Strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children arise up, and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain, but a woman that fareth Ahaya, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gates. But her own works praise her in the gates. Doing good works, and this is the woman that excelled when it talked about how the young women were taught to be good. She excelled in being good in all things. So now her works the works of our hands are actually building a household. I know I didn't break down all these things in Proverbs, but we'll be here for a very long time. <laughs> but I hope everybody gets the gist. And if there's any questions in Proverbs 31, I will, I will definitely answer them. But you can see how the wise woman actually builds her household by actually growing in the things that she learned from her youth. And actually implementing those things and being strengthened in those things and it actually causes her to be a aid not only for her husband but also for her children and also for anyone else that runs into her yeah and you can see he trusts her he trusts her because her works are good the way that she treats him she respects him she honors him. When a righteous man feels he has a fruitful possession and can trust his wife's soul, what does he do? All right. Um, Sirach 26 and 20, please. Sirach 26 and 20. When thou hast gotten a fruitful possession through all the field, sow it with thine own seed. Trusting in the goodness of thy stock. So when a man feels that he's got a fruitful possession, he has a good wife, she's loving, she's nurturing, she's an aide, she's helping, right? He sows it with his own seed, trusting in the goodness of his stock. I mean that he's he's happy to have children with her. And you can see it in today's society that a lot of men are not happy to have children with women. True. You can see it. They them for pleasure but they're right. upset when they're pregnant. When they get pregnant, it's a problem. Yeah. And then usually that's when the problem happens and usually that's when the woman becomes bitter and she starts using the child against them because he don't want to be a part of it anymore because he didn't trust her. Right. He didn't really like who she was. He was just using her for the physical, 
And once it became more than physical, where a child came involved, we tried to break away and get away from it. Yeah. And then she's bitter and she uses the child to hurt him as she tried to hurt him the whole time. But, you know, a lot of men will only allow you to go so far with them. They will only put up with so much to get what they want. But now she has that child and she and that's the only thing she can use because he doesn't want anything to do with her. So she uses the child, uses the child to try to hurt him. So you guys can understand that, you know, a lot of times, even in um, a lot of relationships where men are being abused by the woman, they don't have a lot of children. They may have one, maybe two children. People aren't having big families anymore because of the household itself. And a lot of times it has nothing to do with financial. Because even when we were in Egypt and we didn't have the finances, we were still having children. Yeah. Because we trusted that Allah would take care of us. And we knew that we're resilient. We're, we're going to find a way to survive. It's more than just not having children. It's because men is innate in us alahayam's ways we have to fight against alahayam's ways alahayam operates in us especially the children of israel we have those morals we know when we're doing something wrong when it comes to the the ones that alahayam is, is working in the and i'll just confirm that <laughs> That isn't just opinion. The book of Jasher confirmed Balaam said the children of Israel, the spirit is with them from their youth. So, so we we have to trust our spouse. We have to trust them. And with that trust, we're like, okay, I can sow my seed here and know that it's gonna be on good grounds. But with the modern culture and the modern uh, lack of spiritual understanding, it causes men not to be comfortable to have those relationships or to have those children and to trust that woman. And I'm speaking just on a perspective of men toward women because of the lesson. But of course, there's another dichotomy to this. But just based off of the scriptures in themselves, when a man knows that he has a fruitful possession through all the field, that means that all the women, and he knows that Allah has given him a fruitful possession, he's going to sow it with his own seed, trusting in the goodness of his stock. But yes, okay, I got somebody that I trust. I got somebody that I know is going to take care of the children. They're going to take care of me. We have a great relationship. She's an aid to me. She's always there for me. I love her. Okay, I'm going to build a house with her. Got anything on that, Casa? Um. I thought you explained it well. It's he said he's gotten a fruitful possession, so he got it from somewhere. Allah Hayim sent this woman into his life. Because remember, we were talking about a righteous man. This isn't just any man. He took the time focusing on growing himself and getting himself together so that when this good woman comes from the Lord, he's in the right place and she's in the right place for them to come together in truth. And you can see him trusting in the goodness of his stock, I thought as well. Her being his flesh, he's trusting in her as well. <laughs> like he's seeing, like, as we talked about in man, his wife, and Christ, that he sees himself in her. He sees Yache in her, just as Yache is working in him. And he's completely optimistic. 
not worried about anything because he has a virtuous woman and they're connected spiritually and physically it isn't like the world today where most of the time relationships started from carnality and desire and then they continue in that carnality and a lot of evil spirits attack the house the relationship and cause all the turmoil where the lack of trust the man doesn't trust the woman as he was explaining the woman may be out in the world she's deceitful doing her own thing or she's working against him child comes into the picture then forces the situation into a harder place between the both of them so we see there's a good dichotomy of going the way through the spirit with Allah to come together in spirit and flesh or going according to the world where the flesh the carnal things rule the relationship and lead it astray now we you we all know that Allah works in mysterious ways now there don't it doesn't mean that if you have a carnal relationship that started carnally that Allah is not in the midst of it because a lot of times Allah may have done that to get you in that relationship for you to learn what you need to learn so you can grow and that y'all can actually grow together even if sometimes you have to wait for your significant other to come along whichever one of you guys goes first and actually starts implementing and growing first you know that's why it says that the conversation of the wives you may win over your husband you don't know so you really don't know how Allah works but if Allah doesn't want it to be so it's not going to happen the unbeliever is going to break away from the believer so you're gonna you're gonna know regardless and then if that happens then you know to wait on Allah for him to give you a righteous wife or husband so that you can actually do things in proper order, all right? Um, we got some final encouragement. Um, Brother Kasi, you mind reading the Epistle of Ignatius to Polycarp, uh, chapter 5? Sure. An ex an excerpt out of chapter 5. Sure. The Epistle of Ignatius to Polycarp, chapter 5. Tell my sisters to love the Lord and to be content with their husbands in flesh and in spirit. Polycarp was one of the, um, was he a bishop? Yes, he was a bishop of a church. Polycarp was one of the bishops of one of the churches. Uh, this is after the time of the apostles. And uh, um, he said, tell his sisters to love the Lord and be content with their husbands in the flesh and in the spirit. You have to be content, and you have to nourish and help each other grow in the flesh and in the spirit so that you guys can become one and that you guys can be content with one another so that that wanton eyes and the flesh may not lead you astray. Amen. Uh, that sounds like a big a big deliverance from fornication to be content and right. even as you mentioned how things don't have to start off perfect for Allah I may have put us in a relationship where we both had um the growing growing areas that we needed but if we're content and put in the work to build with each other it can be turned because the scripture did say in Sirach, he giveth a wicked woman to a wicked man. So he'll put it together like, hey, you all need each other. So I'm going to put you together, see who all can learn from each other, right? right. <laughs> and then if you're content to put the work in, then Allah also said that he heals, he wounds, he kills, he makes alive. So it may be he strengthens one person to take that step forward to walk in the faith. And then you have Corinthians to show by you walking in the faith, you may save your husband or the man may save his wife by them seeing the example. And then Allah turns the family around to where both 
We stand in the faith through contentment. So, holiness with contentment, I should say. Well, if anybody has any questions or, or any comments, you can leave them in the comment section of the video, or you can send us an email at HebrewReaders at gmail.com. Please go and check out the website, www.hebrewreaders.com. Uh, we love to have you. Please send us an email if you have any questions or anything that you want to ask us. Um, we hope you guys enjoy this women's series and um, pray to Haya for allowing us to to bring it forth for everybody. Amen. Got anything, Cosmo? We good. Well, yeah, as you mentioned, a website, we also have some new information and additions to the website. For those who are wanting to understand the names of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, if you get on the website and you hit the three bars in the corner to bring up the tabs, then you'll see Church Home, and you hit the plus sign to bring the drop tab, and there you hit the tab the true doctrine of Christ. If you scroll down, you'll get to the names of the Trinity. Here is a collection of some information regarding the name of the Father. We have his name in the Hebrew, the transliteration, and the phonetic according to the International Phonetic Alphabet. And if you hit the play button, it'll give you the pronunciation of the name in the true Hebrew language. And along with that, there's a short write-up on why the name is true and some links for further edification on the website and on some videos. The same goes for the name of the son and for the name of the mother. And she's known by a few names. So hopefully this is edifying and helpful. And with that, well, praise Ahaya. Look forward to spending time with you all on the next one. All right, everybody. Shout out to tell them, everyone. Thank <music> you.